All right, let's start. So have you tried the problem I gave you? All of you? Whoever has done it or tried, just let me know if you finished it or you have any confusion. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's the question, right? Okay, so what you have is you send a beam, I mean a particle, right? It has a charge Q and uh, then you have a magnetic field starting somewhere in this region. So let's say <coughs> you have magnetic field going inward. As soon as you enter this part of the uh, re this, this region where there is magnetic field, this turns like this. So it bends, right? So magnetic field is into the page <coughs> and uh, let me turn on my video. So magnetic field is into the page. Your velocity is in this direction, V. So V cross B, V in this direction, B in this direction, V cross B is upward. So force at this point is upward and then it bends, and then V cross B in this direction and this direction. So it starts a circular motion. You know that. Right. So I have told you the, so in the region, the maximum deflection, like how much it deflected from its original path is this much so d right and the path traveled is a okay so i think all of you at least tried the simple circular motion that we did in the class like if the m is the mass of the particle and v is the velocity then mv squared by r considering that this is r is the radius of this circular path <coughs> i don't know why it's moving this on i don't like okay r so mv squared by r This is the centripetal force that is provided by the magnetic force. So charge times velocity times the, the magnetic field, magnitude, okay? So from this, you can easily find mv, which is momentum p equal to what? <coughs> Q v R. Okay, this is P, the momentum. Now R is not given. What I gave is this displacement D from the original path and the distance travel A. So it's a simple geometry question actually. You should be able to do this. Let's see if I have a circle here. So you have a circle. <coughs> uh, whose radius is R. Right? 
which means this is also I. Uh, you know this displacement. This is D. And this one is A. So tell me what part, what, what is this part? How much is the length of this piece? Can anyone tell me? <coughs> no one? This is D means this also D. Yeah, R minus D. This part is R minus D. And this is A. So how much is R? square plus r minus d whole square simple Pythagoras theorem from this you can find out r in terms of a and d and you can put that value here that will be your answer <coughs> try to do that let us proceed to the next topic I think you can easily do it now very slow. I actually had another application faster but then in the end decided to use just the Google Meet whiteboard for this class. One more exercise we'd like to do is very standard and we did it in the class last time just we didn't do any mathematics so let's do a little bit of mathematics the problem of when there is also an electric field electric field in this direction we have magnetic field in this direction and let's just say this is x, this is y, this is z. We saw that we will see a trajectory like this. Remember? So basically your velocity or 
the movement will be confined in the Y and Z plane. There is nothing in the X plane because you have magnetic field in this direction. Initially, uh, the charge will be at rest. So V equal to zero. <coughs> and then your electric field will push it upward. So it will move a little bit. And once there is a velocity that is not equal to zero, magnetic force will come into action because it's Q times uh, V cross B. It's really annoying how Google V cross B. So V cross B is perpendicular to V and B, so which is this direction. So it pushes in this direction. Uh, electric field is pushing it upward. Magnetic field is pushing in this direction. So it starts moving in this direction. At some point it becomes uh, absolutely directed along the Y direction. And then V is in this direction. B is in this direction. So V cross B force is downward. So it pulls it down and electric field is pulling it upward. So opposite forces slows the particle down. So it slows down and in the end it comes to rest. And as soon as it comes to rest, V is again zero. So magnetic force is zero. Then electric field dominates and pushes it upward and the same thing repeats. Let's try to solve this. <clears throat> so, uh, velocity, we can write it as zero x cap, right? No movement in this direction, plus, let's say, y dot, y cap. So the magnetic force is Q times V cross B, Q, X, Y, Z, zero, Y dot, Z dot, V, zero, zero, which will be just a B and Q here. Z dot Y cap minus Y dot Z cap. <coughs> okay. This is your magnetic force. And then electric force is just Q times E along the upward direction, which is Z. <clears throat> so my total force will be E minus Y dot Z cap plus V here is a little bit B B Z dot Y cap okay now we'll apply the Newton's law and so force equal to mass times acceleration, mass times, of course there is nothing in the x direction, so just y double dot y cap plus z double dot z cap. 
So this is mass time acceleration. If you put this force value here and compare both sides for y component and z component, you will find two equations that you can bring together and it will be finally, let me just write down the final one. I'll give you the details, um, <coughs> detailed you know, derivation later. So it will become for omega equal to omega times E over B minus Y dot, where omega is equal to QB by F. This equation, if you solve, it just involves y dot and y triple dot. The solution of this equation is standard and it's called a cycloid, which you, you already know how it looks like. So you will find y from here, y of t, and then you can put it in another equation involving a relation between y and z, which will be like y double dot equal to omega z dot, putting it here, and you will find z of t. So you will have y and z, the solution look like this. So I'm C1, no, let me just finally write down the exact, no, let's just, uh, not the exact one at least, just before that, cos omega t plus C2 sine omega t plus E over B t plus C3. Z of t would be similar. C2 cos omega t plus 2b minus C1 sine omega t plus C4. <coughs> so this C1, C2, C3, C4 are unknown that you can find easily using the conditions that initially when at time t equal to zero at the beginning the velocity was zero so x dot was zero y dot was zero z dot was zero at time t equal to zero because we started with putting the putting the charge there just of course also x was zero y was zero z was zero because uh, it was at the origin at time t equal to zero. If we use those conditions, then at t equal to zero, y equal to zero, this is zero. Cos omega zero is one, so c1. Sine omega t is zero, this is zero, c3. So usually, c, so just c1 equal to minus c3. Same condition here. This is zero, then this is one, so c2, this is zero. So again, c2 equal to minus c4. These conditions, when you apply, we will have the you know, the final, just before the final, we'll have this uh, y of t equal to c1 cos omega t plus C2 sine omega t plus E over B minus T minus C1. And then for Z, C2 cos omega t. Just bear with me. This is really boring to explain in an online class. C2. Okay, so we are left with C1 and C2. These two unknowns, at least. And now we can apply uh, the velocity at the beginning was zero. How will you get the velocity? Just take a ddt. So y dot. And then here cos omega will become 
minus omega sin omega t. And this will become omega cos omega t and so on. So you will find uh, this y dot t equal to uh, c1 omega sin omega t then here c2 blah blah blah. Then you apply the same condition at t equal to 0 this is 0 and so again you will find uh, values of c's. So you will see that your c1 will turn out to be 0 and c2 will be minus e over b omega from these two conditions you know and finally it's over i mean you at least understand the process i'll give you as, as an assignment with some help you can absolutely find the solution on your own so what you will find in the end <coughs> is that y of t is e over omega b omega t minus sine omega t and z of t will be similar e over b omega omega t 1 minus cos omega t you can plot this and you will see that this looks like actually when I start teaching you programming I will make you plot these things using computer programming so you can get rid of the T's by you know combining these two equation and then it will be a equation between y and z like let's say take everything on this side take everything on this side then you will have sine omega t cos omega t square them and add them you know sine square theta plus cos square theta equal to one using that you will find a nice <coughs> relation but anyway that relation will give you a plot between y and z like this so finally you exactly solve this mathematically is it clear or very complicated or confusing just let me know Okay, let me move on to an interesting topic. I hope it's not that boring. So let's uh, learn a little bit about current because we are talking about charges in motion. A charge is moving and when uh, and then magnetic force on it. But anyway, when a charge moves, there's a rate of change of charge at any point, right? 
some charges are passing through this point so it's changing the charge at this point is changing and that's what we call a current we never thought about current being a vector right current was always a scalar but have you considered thinking about why current is a scholar uh, sorry scalar anyone Are you guys there? <coughs> I mean, the charge is moving in some direction, right? So it has a velocity. It should be a vector. Why is it uh, considered a scalar? there to answer let me try to answer this uh, let's say we have a wire like this Sorry. okay some current is passing through this wire at this point, the direction of the charge is in this direction, okay? So the velocity in this direction. So the current has this direction. On this point, the current has this direction. And on this point, the current has this direction. Does the charge that is moving in this way has any choice, has any choice of, uh, you know, changing its direction? I mean, if I change the shape of this chart, uh, of this wire, let's say like this, if I, I can do that, right? It's a wire, so I can just bend it, and the charge has no option but to go in this way. So, it's useless to think of current as a vector if it does not have you know a freedom to choose its direction for example in free space a, in empty space an electron is moving in this direction so it's free it's free to go in this direction it's not forced or confined to bend and go in a given direction you know but if you have a wire that you have wrapped around in your house like this, then the charge inside it is forced, it's forced to take exactly the same directions as given by this wire. And that's why it's useless to talk about uh, the vector nature of current <coughs> but in free space in three dimension a charge has a freedom let's say you have a fat cylinder like this inside actually a charge can go in this way in this way or this way at least it has a freedom to move inside freely and therefore its its vector nature is important it can take any direction it wants to given some force is applied in that direction so a force is applied in this direction the electron will move in this direction then i apply another force here it can move in this direction 
so in three di in three dimension or even in two dimension let's say you have a flat surface like this and you put a charge Q here so it can go in this way or that way at least inside this 2d sheet it is free to move in any direction that's why its velocity vector has a meaning so the current in this case is really a vector while in one dimension it's just the direction that we define by one dimensional wire and then the charge is forced to just follow that path of the wire so that's why in one dimensional wire case we never talk about current being a vector so why I'm talking about these things because we just learned about force on a charge a force is moving uh, sorry a charge is moving with a velocity v the force on it due to an electric field is electric field u is key v and due to a magnetic field is velocity cross v that's our total force <coughs> but a moving charge if it's not just one charge you know if there are a line of charges like pipora like ends they're moving then it's really a current so force on one point charge we know what about force on a wire carrying some current I let's try to understand then current in terms of line of charges let's say you have a piece of wire If this has a uniform density of charge, like at each point, there are same amount of charges at any, any small element, you know. If this is like one centimeter, let's say, and if there are Q charges, then on other part of this wire, if that has the same one centimeter length, then it also has a charge Q. <coughs> In such cases, we say that this wire has a uniform charge density. Uniform charge density. Lambda. Okay. Lambda is uniform charge density, which is a charge per unit length of the wire. So lambda is the charge per unit length of the wire. Let us express this in terms of current. So this is our wire, let's say. And let's take a small element of this wire. So current is going in this direction. Some charges are moving in this direction and the charge density is lambda. Let's say DL is this small length element. <coughs> if these charges are moving with some speed, uh, let's say V at any moment, at any element, V, then what is this length? The length is speed times dt. dt is the time taken by these charges to cross this dl length. You know the formula s equal to vt, right? 
distance equal to velocity times time. It's the same thing. So DL length covered by these charges with velocity V in time dt. And what is DL? Well, how many charges are there in this length DL? Well, if lambda is the charge density in this length, then density times the length would be my charge in this, right? Because charge per length is lambda. So lambda times length is our charge. That's what I wrote. So I can take DL equal to dQ over lambda and put it here. So DL is dQ over lambda V dt. That means dQ dt is what? Lambda V. And what is dQ dt? Rate of change of charge, which is nothing but current. So current equal to lambda V. We can write it in vector form, I equal to lambda vector V. So the direction of current is the direction of the velocity of these charges. Put it in a box. This is for the current in a wire. So, we know the force on a charge, right? It was this thing I erased. F equal to Q times electric field plus Q is right here outside. So, V cross Q. We know the magnetic force on a charge. What about the magnetic force on a line of charge, like a lot of charge? All we have to do is just <coughs> integrate over all these charges. So if we know the uh, force on, let's say, a small charge dQ, which would be, of course, let's say dF, Magne magnetic force would be what dq times v cross v right qvv then the full force would be just integration of that so integration of dq v cross v would be what would be force on a piece of wire, right, over some length. That will be our force. On a current carrying wire, magnetic force. Now, what is dQ? Sorry, I should write maybe this Q. So dQ, <coughs> It's just lambda dl, right? Lambda dl. So we can write lambda dl v cross v. Now lambda is a constant charge density. We can bring it outside the integration and we'll have dl v cross v. 
or just one second. What is really lambda times v? Lambda times v vector is current vector, right? So we could write dl, and then I take lambda inside, write it as current times v. So finally, if you have a current carrying wire, then the force on this wire due to a magnetic field is F mag DL. So for whatever it's like, uh, you can be from A to B, let's say. What is the force on this piece of the wire that has a current I? A to B, and then current I times B. We'll just finish in a, in a two, three minutes, okay? Now, <coughs> dl times i vector we could also write it as just current times dl vector because really what is the direction of the dl dl is this piece and the direction of this piece is as the direction of the wire what is the direction of the current it's same the direction of this wire so instead of writing dl magnitude times current vector, we could also write magnitude of current times dl vector. It's the same thing. So this thing, we could just write as d, sorry, we could just write as i magnitude dl vector times v. And often the current is a constant current in a wire supplied by a battery or something. So we could just take it outside. So this is dl cross b. If you are given to measure the force on a piece of wire getting a current i from point a to b, then you could put a to b. Otherwise, you don't need the usually you don't need the upper limit. So let me just write it without the limits. Is this for a constant current? This is this. We'll do a very interesting problem next time using this formula that we have derived. And hopefully that will be your offline class, not this boring, where it's uh, really not easy to catch your attention <laughs> also it's a holiday anyway that's it for today